Um, kia ora everyone, I am Eliza Bitpretty and on behalf of the New Zealand Association of Resource Management, thank you for registering for the webinar on biophysical risk mapping to understand inherent on-farm and sediment loss risk. For those of you who are not familiar with ENZAM, ENZAM is an association for professionals involved in the natural resource management, in particular the land and water space. Enzyme webinars are produced out of the Enzyme Capability Building Project, a three-year program where Enzyme has partnered with the Ministry for the Environment and regional councils to support the upselling of individuals across the sector. We are lucky enough today to have Esteban and Glenn, who will discuss how WSP worked with the Bay of Plenty Regional Council to create biophysical risk maps for nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment and E. coli using freshly available data layers for two catchments. Before I hand over, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, could you please put them in the Q&A at the top of your screens and we'll answer these towards the end. Thanks again for registering and I'll now hand over to you, Glenn. Oh, well, thanks, Eliza. Um, so as you've discussed, we partnered with Bay of Plenty Regional Council um, to produce some um, biophysical risk maps. Do you want to skip to the next slide, Isran? Uh, so Bay of Plenty had done some work previously trying to identify um, parts of their catchments where the risk of contaminants to waterways might be greatest and so they were looking for a tool or something that might reduce that cost to landowners when they're preparing farm environment plans and doing risk assessments. Um, so what we tried to do was use freely available data sets if we could find them or the information that Bay of Plenty themselves had. We, Bay of Plenty wanted us to produce an open access toolbox or, or a tool that could be used more widely than just within their organisation. And as, as I said, the project was funded through access to experts. Yeah, yeah, next. So we were looking at the four contaminants of nitrogen, E. coli, phosphorus and sediment. Those are the key contaminants um, in the MPS for fresh water. And we were trying to identify the biophysical characteristics of the land that would lead to those contaminants entering water bodies. Um, so through this project, we were hoping to be able to identify the parts of the land that might help landowners and farmers target areas to mitigate those potential contaminant sources and to produce a toolbox that could be shared widely. Next. So what is biophysical risk, inherent biophysical risk? It considers the factors of the land that aren't easily changed, such as the soil properties, slope, angle, climate, distance from waterways, land cover, you know, pasture trees, um, and it shows where risk of contaminant loss might be. What it is not, it does not consider farm management practice or any mitigations that a farm may have implemented. It does not estimate the contaminant load, so therefore it is not useful for regulation or limit setting. And it's not perfect product we've developed, it's just in its early stages and it relies on the data that has been fed into it. Next. So type of things we look at are terrain and topography, land cover or land use. So, a, 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 for example, a pastoral site is going to be more likely to contribute fecal coliforms than a forested slope. Um, we have a waterways layer that can help determine proximity to waterways and the chance of a contaminant entering that waterway. We look at climate and we include various soil factors. What we're not considering is what the farmers do on that land whether they're cultivating, whether they're spreading effluent, spreading fertilizer, whether they're irrigating or storing feed, feeding out any of those things, this model doesn't consider those things. But what it does do is give them some guidance 
or where they might want to manage those risks or those activities. Um, so I've been doing farm environment plans for probably 10 years now, and, and what we found was missing was, was something that brought all of these, these um, factors here in red together to provide something useful for farm environment planners and farmers. Typically, we'd have to look at the soils map and determine risk for various contaminants. We'd have to look at the waterways and determine risk. So the maps that we've developed should give some guidance, we hope, as to the areas on the farms that would be best suited to mitigations or high risk areas where um, people need to focus their management attention. Next, please. Um, working in the Bay of Plenty, we started with two primary catchments here. Um, the Waihe Estuary, um, they're quite reasonably sized. They have a varied topography, varied uh, land covers, varied farm systems within them. Um, and they provided a good basis to test the various um, components of our models against the four contaminants. And Ishvan's now going to talk about how we did what we did. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Um, yeah, welcome, everyone. And um, so my name is Ishtan, and I'm part of the primary industries team at WSP. And I brought my geospatial expertise to the project. So in terms of the, the methodology, there's a few steps to go through. Um, uh, but ju we ju due to the fact that this is a very transparent project, um, I'll walk you through it. So step one is obviously a bit of research and data gathering exercise, which we, as part of that step, we also reviewed some of the existing models out there. And we know we are aware of um, some of the efforts and has been tackling this challenge in terms of uh, mapping contaminant risk. But they didn't quite provide the, that sort of risk um, view at a management scale that we were after in this project. So what we try to do is learn from those uh, efforts and, and understand what worked well, what didn't work well, what challenges they, uh, these other organizations had, and try to <clears throat> get around those. And of course, we, we reviewed the available data sets, and um, we were also thinking about how this may change in the future. So in terms of the second step, uh, we had to pick um, an approach in terms of how we're going to model this risk. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the key factors around explainability and transparency suggested that we need to go with something that is a well-known technique. It's very robust and um, well-documented. So we decided to go with an analytical hierarchy process. I'm just going to call it. AHB for short. Uh, and then, so this is a multi criteria decision making technique, and it is particularly useful for mapping areas with different characteristics uh, to identify suitable locations for certain things, for example, or to identify risk. The Some of the benefits of this technique is that um, you can control every single uh, part of this process and we can integrate expert opinion and it really uh, it is a really good fit for a, a geospatial exercise like this one it integrates very well <clears throat> with gis and it can handle all sorts of different data types uh, so vectors rasters um, which was important uh, for this project and um, we also have a second process which we use for the sediment uh, model which is a, a more simple uh, GIS-based uh, function, which we can call maximum value overlay process. And the reason um, behind these two approaches is that, um, so the AHP would fit really well the E. coli, nitrogen, and phosphorus uh, concept, while the maximum value overlay was a uh, but much, much better for the sediment, because in the sediment model, we're looking at different erosion processes, and we really wanted to <clears throat> highlight 
those dominant processes for a, for a, for a given location that will appear on our risk maps. So that's sort of the, the background, and I'm just going to talk about the AHP in a little bit more detail. Um, so starting on the left-hand side, um, you would start with um, building up your your hierarchy. So essentially what your goal is, which is identifying risk areas in this case, and then we would need to identify those different categories of information that we need to achieve that goal, and then identify the layers that you need um, in those categories, and also the the next level in the hierarchy is the attribution and the different categories, different alternatives um, within those GIS layers. So you can think about this as a hierarchical uh, structure and different levels. And then moving to the middle, you would compare these layers and run a, a pairwise comparison analysis. And that's the purpose behind that step is to identify um, which layer is more important than the other and quantify that. And then once you have all these matrices sorted, then you can run normalization and some other calculations and you will end up with a list of weights, which is on the right hand side. And then once you have that, then you can integrate this into a GIS uh, to run the mapping exercise. So in terms of GIS, there's uh, it's, a, it's a pretty standard uh, process. So again, starting from the left and on figure A, you have the different factors and GIS layers, and obviously we have a catchment to work with, so we'd, we would make sure they are all clipped to that extent. And then after that, there is a chain of different geoprocessing steps, uh, including rescaling and transformations and conversion of the data so they can be um, fed into the, to the calculations at the end. So we, we convert everything to rasters, and then we run the calculations on that. And you can see that on figure eight, the calculation is a very simple sum of these weighted factors. Uh, while in figure B, it's, a, it's an easier and shorter process, and we only have three factors in there. And then we would just take the maximum value of those three to get our uh, sediment risk map. So that's pretty much it. Uh, so the next step, once we had our maps, we wanted to validate them and sense check them. So uh, it's it's always a scary moment when uh, someone makes a map and then uh, it's put to the test. So what we did, we we uploaded all these maps into uh, web apps and went to the field. So we visited pre-selected locations and uh, with, with a lot of assistance from a uh, Bale Country Regional Council. So we visited these sites, uh, took photos, took notes, and tried to understand whether our maps represent reality or not. Do they make sense? Do they provide the pattern that we are expecting? And uh, not just us, but also land managers and farmers. So it is, uh, it is a very interesting exercise, but we, we learned a lot during this process. And uh, part of the validation, we also did a bit of desktop work. So just uh, as an example, if I overlaid the maps on uh, like E. coli maps on a given farm, then you see those those patterns come through. But uh, what the table shows you is what's actually happening there in terms of the GIS layers. So you, on the left hand side in the table, you can see the input layers and then the red the, uh, the red point or pin indicates a location which we consider high risk. It's uh, it's because it's it's a valley bottom situation close to a waterway. There's a, a given amount of rainfall and it's high producing grassland and we know that it's on poorly drained soil. And then when you look at the green pin, that's uh, a very different scenario uh, away from the waterways, uh, well drained soil and it's a, a forested area. So it's uh, considered low risk in terms of E. coli. So these are, this is just to show you what the, the underlying data uh, is for different uh, environmental settings. So we did that for, a, for quite a few locations. And then, as I said, we learned heaps and 
went through a few iterations because we we had a few um, weaknesses in our uh, process that we had to improve on. So some of our maps uh, were either over or under representing reality uh, based on the feedback. So we made adjustments and recalculated weights and our scoring to make sure that our maps show what uh, they should. So just want to show you some of the results since uh, the project aimed to map these two catchments. So these are our output maps and you can see clearly that they are very different and also the catchments uh, have been uh, given different sensitivity scores by by other uh, projects and other assessments. And that comes through quite well when we compare the patterns within uh, against each other in, in terms of the two catchments. But also you can see the amount of detail that these maps uh, can provide. Obviously, they are going to be just as good as the input data. So there's, uh, there's a few uh, important notes in our documentation, which I'm going to talk about later, that highlights these. So let's move to a, a farm scale view. So with a bit of cartographic design, you can overlay the output layer uh, on the landscape. And uh, you can see how those uh, warmer colors or the red colors uh, highlight the high risk areas for E. coli and uh, the green ones essentially suggest lower risk areas. And that's mostly due to the hydrological connectivity in this case. So essentially, if you have a waterway close by, that will, that will be a, a highly important factor. But also you can see how the terrain is affecting the patterns. So left hand side is just showing you again those input layers. And the node there is obviously preference is, is a LIDAR DEM, uh, which we use to calculate different geomorphic features and landforms. And in terms of the soil properties, uh, SMAP is preferred, but the model can work with the fundamental soil layers as well to fill the gaps if needed. And if we zoom in uh, another level, so we can we kind of get into that management scale, and this is really where we would like to um, have impact, and and that's where we see the this model being useful. So uh, that that picture on the top right shows the the reality, and the the bottom right is how it looks like in a 3D GIS uh, environment, and obviously I overlaid the E. coli map on this uh, terrain, and you can see the, the red areas around the waterway come through quite well, which does make sense. And um, this area was identified as high risk, obviously, by the farmer uh, a long time ago because it's it's fenced off, it's planted. So that suggests that um, the decision making could be informed by models like this. So we were you know, quite happy to, to see that uh, confirmation coming through. But uh, it's just important to know that decision making doesn't need to happen at the spatial resolution that this model provides. So that uh, there's, uh, there's a few key points there. So how can it work for you? And uh, it's very simple. So it's an ArcGIS uh, toolbox. If you're familiar with the the, the platform, uh, you can easily make it work. We tested on the 3.3 versions and that worked fine. And we also created a document that describes the process step by step, how you, what you need to do, what the model does, how it works, and essentially how you can bring the toolbox into your ArcGIS. Um, th there's a bit of data prep to do, obviously, to, to make it work. Uh, but following this guidance, uh, it should give you a pretty good start and uh, you'll be able to make it work. Uh, the models run fairly efficiently. Uh, so if I give you some reference in terms of uh, the time needed. So for the for the Waihi catchment, which was about 330 square kilometers, 
it takes about a minute for for one contaminant to run uh, on a on a decent laptop so it's pretty good and uh, just as an example we ran the model on a on a much much larger area so i think it's about 10 times larger than the, the other catchment the pilot catchment we used and it ran for about uh, six to seven minutes so yeah you can see it's it's manageable and you also have the ability to review and adjust the weights if needed and we can imagine this could come useful for different catchments with different settings uh, but this is something we you know we we will probably go back to at some point and seek feedback on how that might happen and then you just click run and you've got your maps uh, Glenn do you want to talk about the next steps and where to go from here yeah so so this was really was a first cut of of producing a tool like this um, by us and um, what we haven't done yet is we haven't tested it in a farm environment plan setting so we, we haven't gone out on a farm and, and gone through the whole risk profile farm environment plan actions um, so that's something we'd like to do and if Ishvan said if there are other data layers improved data layers that come in they can be incorporated um, so to, to that end what we'd like to do is try and explore um, external funding avenues to to maybe expand on this and see if it's relevant to other regions like will it work in your region will it work in Canterbury will it work in in Taranaki um, the, the the one that Ishan just showed there in the Piaka catchment it seemed to work quite well I, I grew up in that area so it, it, it looked good to me um, so if any of you have got any feedback that because you've done something like this before we'd like to know what you found and, and what worked and what didn't and and maybe something we could learn from um, any feedback um, we, we'd also like to look at how to display the various layers and whether we just display maybe the, the most at risk areas or do we display risk for all, all risk high risk and low risk we're not sure yet what would be the best way to to um, display this again working through some practical examples in the field with actual land managers or farmers would, would, would probably be useful so that's where we're at in the moment so yeah we'd, we'd welcome feedback comments um, anything if you've got any ideas if you're interested in something like this or you've done something we'd really like to know about it yeah thanks so I think that's uh, us so thank you for for listening uh, obviously open to questions but I just would like to acknowledge the uh, the access to expert service again for providing the resources and uh, the input from the Bay of Plenty Regional Council's teams um, and this work wouldn't have been possible without them so thank you and thank you everyone for listening again amazing thank you both um so we have a couple of questions that have come through the first is is there a report published about this work that people could access not so, yet yeah the, we've provided a methodology document to bay of plenty regional council that that goes that sits alongside the toolbox but but that's very much a how to use this model rather than a how did we do it, what did we do. So that is something that we're looking at, at trying to pull together. Maybe we'll present at a conference and we can actually bring it together and put some more um, information about how we made the decisions, what we did, and hopefully we might have some more practical examples of that by then to, to be able to share. Awesome. Um, a question here regarding how limiting is it if you have poor SMAP coverage in terms of the scopes of the risk? It would depend what the, the risk was. So the, the nitrogen leaching risk model relies heavily on SMAPs, but the others, we, we can we can weight them differently if there's poor SMAPs coverage so that it doesn't look too heavily on soil because there are many components that make up like position in the landscape, climate, um, land cover, and so on. So we can account for that in, in various ways if, if there was a particular catchment that had poor SMAPs coverage here. Um, and another one here just around that how easy or difficult did you find in terms of the data collection? Were you able to find enough information that was granular enough? Um, do you want to talk to that one, Ishvan? I, I guess we, we've 
work with what we had, didn't we? We, we did have to resample a lot of stuff to make it useful. But I mean, again, if, if the resolution was poor, we, we could put lower weighting on that, that factor and, and put more weighting on the things that we it would be important. Say it's proximity to waterways. If, if we have a good waterways layer, we would weight that more highly because that is probably the biggest risk for, let's say, E. coli or, or stream bank erosion, for instance. Yeah, just to add to that, I think we also had limitations around what sort of data we can use because we wanted this tool to be uh, quite, quite, um, quite useful for other other regions as well. We, and didn't want we didn't want to rely on customized uh, data sets, which would probably provide better spatial detail. But then then we will be logged into that data structure. So. The, uh, uh, we had discussions around land cover maps and land use maps, of, of course, and some councils have um, much better products than um, the commonly used national uh, databases. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a compromise, I think. And if it's a, for a specific catchment, you will be able to, or you would be able to customize the model uh, using a GIS analyst uh, expertise to make it run on a different uh, land use, land cover yeah. map if, want to, if you wanted to. Yeah, for instance, Bay of Plenty Regional Council has a landslide susceptibility model that they would like us to see if we can integrate. And, and we haven't done that yet, but we've used readily available data sources and, and they thought that this product that they have might be more informative for their catchment. So we're going to explore what that looks like and see if it's worthwhile. But that sort of thing can be done and it's just a matter of tweaking the inputs and tweaking the, the weights and anyone with um, reasonable GIS skills should be able to do it, I think. Um, we have some more questions here in terms of, do you expect uh, farmers to be able to use these maps or is it more suitable for farm managers, consultants and that kind of thing? And that, are they available for access? Well, they're not available yet. I think Bay of Plenty is going to start using them with their land, <clears throat> land management staff. Um, exactly where it's going to end up, I'm not quite sure whether it's going to be in a public domain, whether it's on the council website or not. I'm not I'm not 100%, but a farmer could use it themselves, yes, if they could view the map and say, these might be the high risk areas on my farm. I mean, it, it isn't perfect. So if, for example, flat, flatter areas where um, maybe there's artificial drains dug and they're not mapped very well, it might show the risk in not quite the right place. So there is some, there are some limitations and people just need to take some of the guidance that will go with this as to how to interpret them. So if, if it's saying there's a high risk on this flat paddock and it's not quite in the right place, then they would need to realign that with the risk profile description that they're putting in the farm environment plan. And so also, what were some of the main challenges when you were validating the maps? And did you also engage with all the farmers in the attachment to do this? No, we didn't engage with all the farmers. Um, we, there were there were a few that we, you were, went to, weren't there, Ishvan? I didn't go and do the validation, but Ishvan did. And um, he could probably speak better to that process. But it, it wasn't, a, it, we, we worked with um, the Bay of Plenty Regional Council staff and their land management management staff who do work in the field. Oh uh, yeah, just a thought on that. So I think one of the learnings was that when we um, we were walking around and we were talking about the risks, um, most of the landowners or land managers and farmers would point to those risk areas where their their management set, management product sit like where they have done something rather yes. than thinking about the underlying natural characteristics so yeah it was really hard to shift the focus uh, back to just the topography the waterways yes. yeah yeah i'd agree and so the probably the hardest thing is is differentiating between risk and and contaminant output so there's a a, a risk of animals defecating in a stream but if there's a fence, that risk is mitigated. And so that's what the farm plan will address. It'll, it'll address those mitigating factors that the farmer is doing. But the risk still exists if that fence was taken away, for example. 
So that's probably the biggest challenge is, is, is interpreting that. So it's not what parts of the farm are generating contaminants that are getting into waterways, it's where could they possibly be generated and what is the likelihood if they were generated there that they would get to a water body. So there's a lot of nuance around that, but it does feed well into a risk profile that's done correctly. Um, another question here just around how different is the biophysical mapping from landscape DNA? Um, it, it's kind of a different product because I think we've mapped the contaminants in a way that's useful for a farm plan. Um, landscape DNA, I, I, I haven't actually used it heavily myself, but they, they are different. They're mapping different things, I guess. Landscape DNA is, is looking at different um, they, they categorise their things differently to, to how we have. Where ours is just a risk index from zero to five. I think that's probably the main difference. They've just been mapped differently and interpreted differently in, in the, the way they've displayed it. But there are there are definitely are differences in, in how they've modelled and the, the different data sources they've used and the different processes they've applied to them. Would you agree, Ishvan? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think that's that's fair. Um, a question here from Paul, what uh, layer did you use for waterways? Yeah, so I think we had we had one layer provided by Bay and the Regional Council in terms of uh, overland flow path uh, information. So we used that, but I think one of the alternatives that could be used more widely as the REC2 layer. Yeah. For for the Fiaka catchment, where we also tried this out, um, we used topo maps and the various different uh, waterways layers that are that are on available. So it wasn't just the rec two; it was what what has been actually mapped. So that picked up the drains and things like that, which is quite important for that catchment with its artificial drainage. So there are options, but I mean, if if a council was to go and map waterways well, or if there was a a catchment group that went out and mapped waterways really well, we could include that in the process. Um, we've got a couple more questions here. How comfortable are you with this risk model being useful if you're not mapping or understanding the land use activity? Um, does this impact your criteria for each risk domain? So it, it's we, what we're looking at is that the, the potential risk that would exist on that landscape. So um, it's not looking at the activity on the land. As far as we've said that pasture is likely to include animals, which has a higher risk of faecal coliforms, say, than forestry. So, and, and forestry is more likely to prevent erosion than pasture. But th those are built into the, the underlying lands that we've used. So in, in terms of that, we're relying on these risk maps to inform the farm planning process. And then the consultant or the farmer or whoever pr prepares that farm environment plan would then describe what mitigating factors are being carried out or what management practices are being carried out. Fluent is targeted to the low runoff parts of the farm. Or, or if someone did find that they were irrigating effluent through a ephemeral waterway and they didn't realise then this could pick that up and they may they may manage things differently in the future, for instance. Cool. I think that is all the questions that we have. There's a few people who have mentioned they've done similar projects who might reach out to you guys with oh, some fantastic. more learnings and things yep. like that. Um, but yeah, this, so this webinar was recorded and was will be available on the Enzyme website by the end of the week. Um, but thank you all again for attending and registering, and thank you, Glenn and Esteban, for presenting today. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks.